As the COVID-19 vaccine begins to roll out across the nation, every American must have confidence in the technology and the system administering it to overcome this deadly virus. Given the dark history of mistrust and abuse in our communities of color with the healthcare system, I asked Wayne Reynolds to come back onto the podcast to discuss this mistrust and its direct and indirect impact on these communities accepting the vaccine. Dwayne is the CEO of Just Health Collective and is a national expert and leader who has helped shape the industry's conversation and thinking around diversity, inclusion, and health equity, illuminating new perspectives and assisting others in connecting the dots between value transformation and belonging. Join us for this timely, insightful, and needed discussion as we continue to work together to overcome the most significant public health crisis of our lifetimes. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Dwayne, welcome back to our podcast, and thank you for taking the time to meet back up today. Thank you so much, Mike. Really excited to be with you again. It's quite an honor. Well, given your work in leading Just Health Collective and the recent deployment of the COVID-19 vaccine, I wanted to have you back on the podcast to discuss mistrust of the healthcare system in our communities of color and its direct and indirect impact on these communities taking the vaccine or not. But before we dive in and discuss this important and timely topic, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment and visit passionatepioneers.com in order to share your feedback and ideas. Simply scroll to the comments section at the bottom of each posted episode. And lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. You will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Well, Dwayne, it was an honor to have you on our podcast back on episode 57, in which we discussed systemic racism in healthcare. That was a powerful episode. For our community, I have left the link for that episode in the episode notes for you to access. But before we discuss the vaccine and its positive and negative effects it can and is having on our communities of color, Dwayne, for our new community members, can you give a brief overview of Just Health Collective? Absolutely, Mike. Just Health Collective is an organization that focuses on consulting and advisory services for healthcare organizations. And that could be across the spectrum, hospitals, payers, health technology companies. But we are really laser focused on advancing health equity and belonging in the industry. Well, thank you for sharing that brief overview of Just Health Collective. Again, in our episode notes, you can access Dwayne's original episode of episode 57 in the episode notes. I'm looking forward to unpacking this timely, important, and far-reaching topic of mistrust in the healthcare system in our communities of color during this critical moment of the vaccine rollout after we get back from thanking our community champion sponsor. This episode of Passion of Pioneers is brought to you by Augmetics, ambient medical documentation and live clinical support. Did you know that nearly 75% of clinicians surveyed in a recent study say they spend over 10 hours per week on paperwork and medical notes? But clinicians who've adopted Augmetics are spending less time writing notes and more time providing superior care to their patients. Augmetics is a leading provider of remote medical documentation using remote AI-assisted live scribes to observe, listen, and capture relevant details from natural conversation for over 35 specialties. Augmetics provides real-time support that includes orders, referrals, and reminders to deliver accurate, complete, and timely medical notes. Augmetics brings back the joy of practicing medicine. To learn more and to bring the Augmetics joy to your practice, visit augmetics.com slash passionate pioneers or click on the link at the top of the episode notes. We are back with Dwayne Reynolds from Just Health Collective, and we have so much to discuss. Dwayne, again, thank you for coming back on the podcast. We're looking forward to discussing this timely topic. So first, let's start. What is the history 
for our communities of color that have created this mistrust of the healthcare system. Can you give us that history lesson? I've been learning a lot myself during this journey with COVID-19 and the direct important topics around our communities of color and thinking about taking the vaccine and that really far-reaching historical perspective of why there is unease in those communities. Can you give us a little bit of that history lesson for that perspective before we dive in around all things COVID-19? Yeah, certainly I can hit some of the high points of the historical injustices that have quite frankly led to the mistrust in many communities of color, but in particular the African-American community. One of the major studies that is often cited is the Tuskegee syphilis study in which African-American men were recruited to be a part of this study. And they were told that they were going to be given treatment for bad blood, which was a term used back in the day to describe ailments such as syphilis, anemia, fatigue. And they weren't actually given treatment for syphilis. So they were recruited under these terms. They weren't consented in the way that we would normally consent a patient today. And unfortunately, the disease was left to run its course. So this particular study is probably one of the more well-known events in African-American history in relation to the healthcare system. But there are so many types of these stories, some of which remain untold. The story of Henrietta Lacks is another that comes to mind. Henrietta cells, cancerous cells, were retrieved from her body posthumously, and she, again, did not consent to that, nor did her family know. Her cells today, called HeLa cells, are actually still alive and have provided much of the backbone for biomedical research. And so, There are these instances of major events in the African-American community that lead to mistrust, but I'd be remiss if I didn't just talk about some of the events on a daily basis, interactions with the system where racism occurs through microaggressions that you might experience when interacting with the healthcare system, experiences of blatant discrimination that occur in the healthcare system. I think we are now become much more aware of these challenges within the system. And so we're starting to reconcile, I think, part of what our history has been. But in the process, I think it's really critical that we engage the community and that we talk about that history so that we can begin to think about how we improve moving forward and build trust in these communities. And Now is a time where that becomes critically important because the health of all individuals depends on everyone's agreement, if you will, to become a part of this vaccine and take the vaccine in order to limit the spread of COVID-19. Well, Dwayne, thank you for sharing that. And one of the areas you highlighted was this notion of microaggressions in the healthcare system with our communities of color. Can you unpack that and maybe expand a little bit. What exactly does that mean? And how is that impacting the trust of our communities of color with the healthcare system? Yeah. So Mike, a microaggression is really just a statement or action that may have an indirect or subtle nuance of discrimination. And it typically occurs against members of marginalized communities. And If those microaggressions occur repeatedly, it can certainly have an emotional impact on one's ability to really deal with and sort of get through these types of actions that come their direction. And in regards to, you shared a pretty profound history around Tuskegee and other examples. In regards to a little bit more current day, Dwayne, obviously there have been a lot of vaccines that you know, children are asked to take before heading into school and other that. In regards to current and recent history, are you still seeing that hesitancy, that distrust? And what does that look like? Is it in the form of, I don't trust my doctor, I don't trust the hospital? What have you heard in those communities for us to better understand that? Yeah, I think the mistrust is both of the institution itself, meaning the hospital organization, and of individuals who make up the organization. 
because it is those individuals that we're encountering that again may have unconscious bias, which means we have a neurological function of taking in information in order to interpret and make decisions. And sometimes in our processing of that information, we may bring in stereotypes and bias that leads us to make decisions that can be discriminatory. And so those interactions may in fact cause other folks who are experiencing clinical care and the processes involved to distrust what is happening. And that distrust can lead them to make certain decisions about whether or not they receive a vaccine, about whether or not they participate in a clinical trial, for instance, quite frankly, about whether or not they even access healthcare. Sometimes decisions are made to forego because of the fear of some type of discrimination occurring in the healthcare environment. And we're going to dive into, you know, how do we continue to bring these communities into the fold to ensure we can vaccinate as many Americans as we can as we go through this journey together. But before even COVID broke out, Dwayne, did you and your team see things that actually did work to overcome this mistrust? What were they? How were they implemented? Can you share any history lesson there of what are some of the things that are working in order to bring those communities into the fold? And we're going to also then more pointedly dive into COVID-19. Yeah, I think a few of the things that are working in order to combat this mistrust have to do with really engaging the community head on. The first thing is being transparent about the actual process of vaccine development. Well, what went into that? Who was involved? What are some of the risks that might come along with? And what are the benefits I think having a broader understanding of that for communities of color, but even in general, really helps people to understand what the process was and whether or not there's the ability to trust what has happened during that process such that you would be willing to take a vaccine. So transparency becomes paramount, and there are health systems that have methods of engaging their community in open forums to be able to have those discussions. Additionally, I think one of the critical ways that we're going to be able to get the Black community to overcome is by engaging Black mothers. We know that women make up 80% of healthcare decisions, and that is true also in the African-American community. So it is likely women in the community who are going to be able to help inform and convince those in their families to trust this vaccine. I think in addition to the role that moms play in families, there are a couple of other avenues that I think are going to be critical. Black churches have a role to play here, knowing that many in the African-American community foundationally have been involved with churches. And so they are often trusted institutions where Black individuals will congregate. And so the ability to have those churches included in this process becomes very important to overcoming some of the mistrust. And then the last group that I would say is really important is Black physicians. It has been studied to show that there's racial concordance when an African-American physician treats an African-American patient. And that concordance simply means that because of their race or ethnicity, there is more trust. And so organizations like the National Medical Association, which represents African-American physicians, should and are playing a large role in trying to get out appropriate information about the vaccine and its efficacy. Collectively, from my perspective, those three groups, moms, churches, African-American physicians, are going to be critical in trying to get out public health messages and campaigns that really resonate with the African-American community. I couldn't agree more, Dwayne, and I think those are great areas to highlight uh, in regards to leaders in our community. But 
there's also a conundrum here. We have an issue because we are having to socially distant during this pandemic. We can't go to church. We can't go to our civic, you know, communities, whether it be, you know, sports leagues or book clubs or whatever that might be. We can't physically engage in those. So therefore, we are watching a lot of social disconnect across our country as well. And then you pile on top of that, this era of disinformation and misinformation that we're living in, in, that is just coming at us full force. What is up? What is down? What is fact? What is not? It is a very confusing time right now. And it is a difficult time for any of us. And especially, as you mentioned, our communities of color to really find that trust and to find that opportunity to say, you know what, I need to move forward with this vaccine. Do you have hope that we can overcome this very chaotic time, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, emotionally, in order to move our communities forward in getting and taking this vaccine? Yeah, I do. To your point, we aren't congregating in the normal fashion, but that doesn't mean that relationships are not continuing virtually or that individuals aren't having conversations with one another. So we may not be able to aggregate in the way that we would normally in order to bring people together to actually have the vaccine, but the conversations are still occurring. And that's the important part of leading through this mistrust. And, you know, I do have hope for where we're headed. I think you know, this entire year has really been a challenging one for many people. And we're looking forward to a day where we don't have to sort of live in fear and be confined to our home spaces and away from our loved ones. So I think just knowing that people are desiring that change and are going to be willing to step out and do what's right in terms of taking this vaccine to ensure that all communities are healthy, I think is going to propel us forward. Certainly, there may remain individuals who choose not to. And the hope is that either those individuals continue to wear masks and socially distance, and or there's some level of herd immunity that occurs. But ultimately, I think most people are going to be compelled to get the vaccine to feel safe and to ensure that they are not continuing to infect others that they might encounter. And in a moment, we're going to ask for a couple points online to find you and the wonderful work that you're helping lead over at Just Health Collective. But you're not just delivering hope for hope's sake. You're actually out there in the industry delivering results. You guys have been growing rapidly over this past year. Congratulations on year one with the organization. It has been wonderful to watch and to see your leadership in our communities across the country. But with that, Duane, as I mentioned, you're not just delivering hope for hope's sake, you're actually delivering results. So with that, given so many leaders in our industry tune into this podcast, what are a couple things that we should be contemplating right now? You know, we're just getting going with the vaccine rollout. What are a couple things that we need to be thinking about top of mind to really execute against what you just described that we need to do in order to move the health of our country forward? I appreciate that question, Mike. We have had a really great year and work with some wonderful organizations. I think what is really critical and important is that we don't lose sight of the fact that we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to systemic and institutionalized racism. We had a moment in our history this past summer where, again, it was heightened really to a world level in terms of discrimination and work towards anti-racism. But the work occurs in the trenches when no one is looking. I feel like we have to keep our eye on the prize and the things that we need to do in order to dismantle these systems of injustice and of racism in healthcare. I think the next piece is really about engaging communities. The only way that we are going to successfully interact and build health for all communities is if we have discussions from representatives of those communities who are at the table providing insights and helping to make decisions about how healthcare can and should change in the future. So I think if we stay focused on the communities and 
the individuals who are part of these communities providing the right answers, then we will make substantive change. Well, thank you for that, Duane. I do appreciate it. And thank you for that message of hope. We need it now more than ever. And so for our community, where can we find you online? There's also, I know, some exciting updates as well. You guys have launched a podcast. Congratulations there. Where can we find all the good stuff happening in your camp online, social media handles, websites, or otherwise? Yes, we did recently launch our own health equity podcast. It's called Centering Health Equity. And it is myself and Dr. Maria Hernandez who will be the host of this podcast. And so we're looking for individuals to be part of our conversations that are focused on what we can do to improve equity and equality in healthcare. So we can be found at centering-health-equity.squarespace.com for our current episodes. I think we have three that are up there now. And Just Health Collective, if you're interested in working with our organization, we are at justhealthcollective.com. And again, very eager to help to liberate our healthcare system and make it a more just and equitable system. Well, thank you, Dwayne. And again, thank you so much for coming back to the podcast. You are our first repeat guest, but a much needed conversation to be had, especially where we are currently as a nation and ensuring that we move our communities of color forward in getting healthy again and having them participate in the COVID vaccine rollout. So thank you so much for sharing all of your perspective here, Dwayne. We look forward to continuing to receive all the wonderful updates from your camp. But for now, thank you again for joining us today, Dwayne. Well, Mike, thank you. I really do appreciate being invited back a second time. And I attribute that more to you and your understanding of the importance of this type of information and being a champion for us. So really do appreciate it. Always great to speak with you. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.